Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown, and this is Matthew Stockton, whose mic is now unmuted. My friend Leah listened to one of her shows yesterday and said, that Mike guy really pronounces your last name with a heavy Canadian accent. Oh, do I? Yeah. She's from New York. I'm like, he is Canadian. <laughs> yeah, there's no other way for me to do it. Hey, I want to do a shout out to somebody. Okay. Tasfia. Tasfia. So Tasfia I met in the Montreal airport this week. Oh. I started chatting. She has a criminology degree. Yep. But she's working in IT. So oh. she, she said she'd give us a listen to sort of live her degree vicariously through the show. So hi, Tasfia. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Tasfia. <laughs> the views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor its parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. Colton Bushi was a 22-year-old Indigenous man from the Red Pheasant First Nation in Saskatchewan. He was shot and killed on a farm near Bigger Saskatchewan on August 9, 2016. His death received widespread attention and led to a national conversation in Canada about systemic racism and the treatment of Indigenous peoples in the criminal justice system. The trial and acquittal of the farmer who was charged with Bushi's death a man named Gerald Stanley, also sparked controversy and led to calls for reforms in the Canadian justice system. This is Dark Poutine episode 256, The Killing of Colton Bushi. Indigenous peoples in Canada and other nations settled later by Europeans have faced systemic discrimination and prejudice for centuries, resulting in many challenges and negative impacts on their lives. Fact. As with the rest of Canada, in the prairies, Indigenous peoples have been subjected to a range of injustices, including the loss of their traditional lands and resources, the imposition of the residential school system, and ongoing barriers to equal opportunities and treatment under the law. Indigenous peoples have also been subjected to racial profiling and discrimination by law enforcement, which has contributed to a distrust of the criminal justice system and a high rate of indigenous peoples in prisons. In recent years, there has been increased attention on the issue of racism against indigenous peoples in Canada in efforts to address this systemic problem. This includes increased public awareness, advocacy by indigenous peoples and organizations, and policy changes aimed at improving the lives of indigenous peoples in the prairies and beyond. However, much work remains to be done to ensure that Indigenous peoples are treated fairly and with dignity and to address the deep-seated systemic issues that contribute to ongoing racism and discrimination. I once uh, 
use the term truth-ish and reconciliation light when talking to a friend who's Coast Salish here, mm -hmm. which had him in stitches because he's like, he's like, it's funny because it's true. You know, there was a lot of fanfare, in my opinion, about truth and reconciliation, but right. na now the hard work has to happen, mm -hmm. right? And, and um, there's a lot of work to do. I can say that I had different opinions than I do today because of what I was told. Yeah growing up, yeah. um, not by my parents necessarily. There weren't any indigenous folks, but in society around, you know, in the media and all that kind mm -hmm. of thing, in film, in television, all of those things, you develop a certain attitude toward people. I say to this day, um, some people might not want to hear this, but we were programmed in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. We were, yes. Ways of thinking. And as an adult, as a white male, I think, or female, I think most people have to sit down with themselves and just, just, you know what? If you carry a little bit of racist thoughts and you catch them and you say, I don't want to be like this yeah. and you work yourself out of it, that is what grown-ups do. That is, right? Yeah. To, to just like... Instead of getting angry at a podcast, <laughs> calling them woke and saying that you don't want to listen to them anymore because they talk about things that make them uncomfortable. Well, but it's true. Yeah. Like, I had to unlearn some stuff that I grew up with. I had to unlearn it. Me too. Right? And, mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with holding your hand up and going, you know what? I deserve better and people I interact with deserve better than this. The controversial story of the killing of Colton Bushy for many has become symbolic of the issues inherent within the Canadian system in regard to Indigenous people and justice. The Guardian newspaper reported that Mark Kleiner, a former pastor with the Lutheran and Anglican churches in Bigger, called Colton, quote, the Rodney King of Western Canada, and said that the case was a flashpoint in the region. The Red Pheasant Nation, where Colton Bushy was living at the time of his death, is a Cree First Nations band government within the province of Saskatchewan. It's located approximately 100 kilometers north of Saskatoon and is one of the many First Nations communities in the province that are part of the broader Indigenous peoples of Canada. The Red Pheasant First Nation has a rich cultural heritage. It is known for its strong traditions, which include a vibrant spirituality, a strong connection to the land, and a deep commitment to community and family. The band takes its name from one of its chiefs, Red Pheasant, a leader of the river people in the late 1800s who lived in the Battleford Eagle Hills region and spent winters in the wooded areas hunting in the southern plains during the summer. According to the band's website, Chief Red Pheasant was quoted as saying, I am a Battle River Indian. Ever since my grandfather lived at Battle River, it has been my home. He was one of the spokesmen at the Fort Carlton Treaty Negotiations in 1876, taking over leadership from his brother Watuni, Tailfeathers, who was initially the leader but was replaced due to his opposition to giving up land for a small amount of compensation. Red Pheasant became chief and signed Treaty No. 6 at Fort Carlton in August 1876 and remained chief until his death in 1888, at which point Watuni resumed leadership until his passing in 1904. Despite their differing views on treaties, both leaders were involved in the treaty negotiations during this time period and had shared leadership from 1876 to 1904. The Red Pheasant Band Office is 35 kilometers south of Battleford, Saskatchewan, a town with a rich history that dates back to the late 19th century. Indigenous peoples, including Cree and Blackfoot nations, originally inhabited the area. The arrival of European settlers and the Canadian government in the late 1800s brought significant changes to the area, including the imposition of treaties and the establishment of a settlement that would later become Battleford. Treaties signed between the Indigenous peoples and the Canadian government in the late 1800s were meant to establish peaceful relations and define the rights and responsibilities of both parties. However, the treaties were often broken by the government and settlers, leading to a number of conflicts and tensions between Indigenous people and those settlers. One of the most significant events in the history of Battleford and its indigenous population was the Northwest Rebellion of 1885. We'll cover that at some point. This uprising, led by the indigenous leader Poundmaker and Métis leader Louis Riel, was in response to the broken treaties and ongoing injustices suffered by indigenous peoples in the area. The conflict resulted in a number of clashes between indigenous peoples and government forces including the Battle of Cutknife, which took place near Battleford. 
Wow, cut knife and Battleford. Right. Yeah. <laughs> very aggressive names. They're very aggressive names for a very aggressive sounding battle. The aftermath of the Northwest Rebellion was marked by further injustices against indigenous peoples, including the suppression of their cultures and way of life, the imposition of the residential school system, and ongoing discrimination and prejudice, also the Indian Act. Like many indigenous communities in Canada, the Red Pheasant First Nation has faced challenges in recent decades, including limited economic opportunities, a high rate of poverty, and significant social and health problems. Despite these challenges, the community is working to preserve its cultural traditions and build a brighter future for its people through a variety of initiatives, including cultural revitalization programs, education and training programs, and economic development initiatives. According to the band's website, when a census of the band was first taken in 1879, the population of Red Pheasant Cree Nation was 416 individuals. As of 2022, the population has grown to 2,490, with 772 members residing on the reserve and the remaining 1,718 residing off the reserve, both within Canada and the United States. Colton Bushy was born on Halloween, October 31, 1993, in Ronan, Montana. Every Halloween after that became a big family gathering for two reasons. For Halloween, of course, and for Colton's birthday. He and his family eventually moved to Saskatchewan. As a boy, Colton was a smart and precocious little guy who was interested in science. His mom described how he used to wear Harry Potter glasses, she said, <laughs> and he would uh, push the glasses up when he was speaking scientifically, apparently. Aww. She also later told documentary filmmakers that Colton had once said, quote, the world would get along if everyone would get a good book and go sit under a tree. I agree so much with that sentiment. Yeah. Imagine if we can kind of just went, sat under a tree and read. Yeah. And maybe beside each other. And yeah. didn't throw barbs at each other yeah, on I social know. media, right? Yeah. To CBC News, Colton's family recalled that as he grew into a young man, he became culturally minded and a spiritual person. He was also involved in the Native American church. They said Bushi had a strong faith in the power of prayer and a love for singing. His family members recall that Colton was often heard walking around the Red Pheasant First Nation singing peyote songs to himself. Even though Colton had a physical disability affecting his hands, he had successfully completed a firefighting and life skills program. Colton was heavily involved in Cree tradition and community events. He was proud to be involved in raising his young nephews. According to his family, who all loved him dearly, Colton was a good guy who cited his late Mosum, grandfather, Victor Denny, as instrumental in instilling in Colton, quote, a strong work ethic and a compassionate nature for his fellow beings, end quote. I find it really important uh, for us to hear who victims like Colton were as people from their families, because the media can start painting pictures that aren't true. Correct. And and to hear from the family, it, the, the, the humanizing, the fact that this was Sounds like a wonderful boy. Yeah. Right? He was like probably every other 22-year-old kid. You know, like I, I say 22-year-old kid because I was still a kid at 22. I think of anyone under 30 as a kid. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're grumpy old men now. So, But I mean, that's the thing. It's like, and that's why I try to include as much about people as I possibly can. I want to hear from their families mm -hmm. who these victims are, right? Yeah. I, I, I want to hear because it's important. Yeah. It's important because, um, well, we'll find out later, Yeah, you know, what people think. The last time Colton Bushy's mom, Debbie Baptiste, saw her son alive was at around 1 p.m. on August 9, 2016, the day of his death. Accompanied by a friend that day, a young woman named Kiora Watuni, Colton let Debbie know he was going swimming with some pals and that he'd be home for dinner between 5 and 6 p.m. Colton and his buddies, Kiora, and another young woman, Belinda Jackson, spent the afternoon drinking and swimming in a nearby river with Colton and their friends, Eric Michance and Cassidy Cross Whitstone. The five pals had a great afternoon with each other. They were driving in the rural municipality of Glensdale near Bigger, Saskatchewan, heading back to Red Pheasant in their SUV, a gray Ford Escape, when their vehicle blew a tire. What happened between the flat tire and the group's arrival at Gerald's farm some minutes later is a bit murky, all of the friends had been drinking. 
Some were napping in the SUV as it drove. The Star Phoenix newspaper reported, quote, that the group drove onto a farm 15 kilometers northeast of Stanley's farm where at least one person tried to steal a truck, hitting the truck's window with a 22 caliber rifle that was in the back of the SUV. The attempt to break the truck's window shattered the wooden stock of Eric Meechance's 22. It had been in the SUV, he later claimed, so that he could go hunting. The rifle's wooden stock and trigger mechanism was later found next to a vehicle at that other property. After that, the group drove further toward home and eventually made it to Gerald Stanley's farm, where they claimed to be looking for help with their flat tire. The tire was shredded and they were riding on the rim at this point. Those present on both sides of the ensuing encounter between the five friends and the Stanley family tell different stories about what happened next. The following facts are from the final report issued by the Civilian Review and Complaints Commission for the RCMP. Sometime after 5 p.m., the Gray Ford Escape turned into the driveway of 54-year-old Gerald Stanley's farm where Mr. Stanley lived with his wife, Lisa. The couple's adult son, Sheldon, was also home at the time of the incident. From the CRCC report, quote, It is not clear whether the five occupants of the Ford Escape shared a common intention when they turned into the Stanley driveway. All had consumed alcohol and some of them were asleep. It does not appear that Mr. Bushy left the vehicle at any point or interacted with any of the Stanley's property, end quote. Once the Ford Escape stopped in the Stanley family's yard, Eric and Cassidy got out of the SUV and appeared to interact with a truck parked on the property, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the pair then jumped onto an all-terrain vehicle that was also in the yard. There are conflicting reports whether or not they tried to start that. Mm -hmm. This all depends upon who you're talking to in this situation. After seeing this happen, Gerald Stanley and his son Sheldon ran into the yard and yelled for the strangers to stop what they were doing. They later said that they believed the group was attempting to steal their property. I probably would have assumed that as well. I lived on a farm and people pulled in. And, strangers. and Yeah, strangers and didn't come to my door to introduce themselves and... If I saw somebody looking into or interacting, whatever that means, with, right. with one of my things and jumping on another sure. one, my alarm bells would go off. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to be defending what's happened. Yeah. Let's keep going. Seeing Gerald and Sheldon running toward them, Eric and Cassidy hopped back into the Ford Escape and tried to drive away. Tire's already flat. Yeah. So the Ford Escape collided with another car that was parked in the yard causing the rim of the already flat tire to get stuck in the gravel and it just started spinning and the vehicle became hopelessly stuck. So now my car is smashed up on my property. So you're Gerald Stanley. Yeah, or I'm, I'm me and somebody, you're Matthew. Some, somebody's come in. I'd be, sure. I'd be pissed, right? Yeah, because... I, I'd be it, pissed. It's Wait. all happening pretty fast. Right, my car is now smashed and people are starting to run away. So I'd be like, hey, they're up to no good, right? Mm. I'd be upset and I'd be yelling at them to stop. Right. So that, that, that makes sense. Yep. All of, all of this, like right to, to date, I see nothing wrong. Well, things go wrong. I know. <laughs> immediately after that. Yep. Sheldon chased after the car and smashed the front windshield with a hammer. Gerald Stanley ran into a nearby shed and retrieved a 22 caliber handgun. Now frightened by Sheldon's angry attack on the SUV, Eric and Cassidy, who had been behind the wheel, fled on foot down the driveway. Gerald Stanley fired two shots at this point. It isn't clear what Stanley's intent was, whether the shots were meant as warnings, as he later claimed, or had he been aiming at Eric and Cassidy as they fled. Regardless, both shots missed. And this is where I would have started acting very differently. Right. Right? I would run to the house for a telephone. I would, I would, you know what? I'd be like, go into the house, right? Um, grab the phone, call 911, mm -hmm. look out my window, give a license plate number for a truck that's there. Yeah. Right? Because he saw it. It's 2016, so they probably even have cell phones. Yeah. You don't even Ooh. have to go into the I'd house. I'd still go inside just for my safety. Sure. Right? That makes sense. Because cars are flying around and cars are smashed up at this point. Yeah. But I'd, I would have extracted myself from the situation and called 911. And, yeah. And been giving descriptions and license plate number. And here's the problem. You have what turns out to be a restricted firearm. 
That's number one. You're firing warning shots, whatever. Like if, if you're firing your but weapon. Isn't that just going to escalate things though? Well, you're firing it and people are running away. So that you're, there, there's two, you're not defending yourself. There's two things, you know, maybe he's hey, trying to scare them off. But as soon as you enter a gun into the situation, mm -hmm. you're, you're escalating. Oh, that's, that's the biggest escalation there can be yep. really at this point. Other than a bazooka or something. Well, yeah, or a nuke. Yeah. Colton Bushy, seeing that he and his group were in trouble and that Eric and Cassidy had abandoned them, jumped from the back seat into the driver's seat and attempted to drive the disabled vehicle away. Still, it didn't budge, regardless of Colton's efforts. Gerald Stanley then approached the driver's side of the car with his gun in hand. Put yourself in Colton's shoes, right? Mm-hmm. As soon as guns start firing i would have been behind that wheel trying to get the hell out of there so he's in the back seat with right, two like, two two I, two of his female the, the, friends you're you're like wow this escalated quickly yeah this guy's shooting guns off yeah uh, let's get the hell out of uh, here that's that i would be totally in flight mode at that point absolutely from the crcc report quote despite differing accounts of what happened next it is clear that the gun in mr stanley's hand went off and the bullet hit Colton in the back of the head, causing his death. Kiora Watuni then got out of the Ford Escape, opened the driver's door, and moved Colton's body to the ground next to the vehicle. Emergency responders later found him there. Gerald Stanley had not said a word to Colton Bushi. Kiora and Belinda leapt out of the back seat to tend to Colton, whose body fell face first onto the gravel when they opened the driver's side door, so they didn't really move him right. he was already dead blood seeped out of the wound to the back of his head gerald stanley's wife lisa who said she'd not seen the shooting approached the vehicle she claimed she heard her husband yell oh my god uh, and on seeing a body beside the stranger's vehicle she yelled to sheldon to call 911 the girls kiora and belinda were distraught and asked her why colton had been shot lisa's answers Lisa's answer, apparently, was not to the liking of the girls, and one of them punched Lisa Bradley, Lisa Stanley, knocking her to the ground. Sheldon, who had yet to call 911, yelled for the girls to stop, and they did. The two, the two girls were charged with assaulting Lisa Stanley, but the charges were later withdrawn. According to an article in the Globe and Mail, Kiora later told Colton's family that Lisa had said, quote, that's what you get for trespassing on private property, end quote. According to the CRCC report, at 5.27 p.m., Sheldon Stanley called 911. After hearing a brief description of the nature of the emergency, the 911 call taker transferred the call to the RCMP's Operational Communications Center, OCC. Sheldon provided the following information to the OCC call taker. Three men and two women had come onto their property and tried to steal vehicles from the yard had almost run someone over, and one of the three men had been shot. The remaining two men had fled the scene on foot to the west and were armed with a gun. The two women remained at the scene, and his mother was speaking to them. His father was the shooter, and the man who'd been shot may be dead. RCMP arrived quickly and secured the scene. EMTs later pronounced Colton Bushy deceased. The barrel section of Eric Michance's broken firearm was found next to Colton Bushy's body. There remains no clear explanation how it came to be there, and the firearm's presence would later play a large part in the court proceedings. The stock, found later as we mentioned, and trigger mechanism were missing. One of the responding officers found a live round in the chamber of the firearm. There was no evidence the rifle had been fired on the Stanley property that evening or any other time during that day. Eric, Belinda, and Kiora were still at the scene, and all three were arrested for mischief. They were subsequently transported to the Battleford's detachment where they spent the night in holding cells. More after a quick break. And we are back. Matthew, thoughts so far? Now, I know you've got a lot written here that yeah. I haven't read on purpose, so okay. I want you to tell me a story. There is a, a famous case that I followed um, when it happened in the UK. Mm -hmm. There's a, a farmer um, 
that uh, named Tony Martin. Yep. Who lived on his own in a farmhouse called uh, Bleak House. Interesting name. Bleak House. Bleak House in Norfolk. Mm -hmm. So this guy had been robbed about 10 times. 10 times. And in 1999, two burglars broke into his home and he, he shot them both and killed one of them. And the one he killed was 16-year-old Fred Barris. Okay. He was convicted of murder. Wow. But it set off a massive, like this was a massive debate in the UK about the right to defend your home. Mm -hmm. And it got really ugly. Some people showing sympathy for the burglars, like they actually broke into his home. They're like, yep. you know, under the cover of night, strangers in your house, right? Yep. So some people excited with them and just portrayed this Martin guy as cold hearted murderer, like cut and dried, done. Yeah. Well, others said the burglars got what they, like ugly stuff online, got what they deserved, right? Saying things like, too bad both weren't killed, uh, and that if you break into someone's house, you deserve to die. Yeah. So both extreme sides that were being played out in the media, right? Sure, sure. And it was a major, major flashpoint, and, and it actually started a whole debate about property rights and everything else. And Martin was convicted of murder, but appealed and got manslaughter, and in the end spent three years in jail. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't help but like compare these cases right right because you know farmer this one's slightly different in that there it was obviously like these kids were obviously breaking into his house you know they had gone in so that's a very different thing but the one major point of difference is in the case in the uk everyone was white yeah right there was not the fact that uh the kids were first we we're committed to broad-based reform in a world to address where a lot these of issues are racist as a country mm -hmm. and we I must think if these and kids we can were white, do better it still probably quote. would have divided public opinion here in canada yeah on the right to defend your home but they weren't so from what i understand it just got horribly horribly ugly yes and it does get horribly ugly the thing about self-defense is if you are under direct threat you have the right to defend yourself if you are in fear of your life. Yeah. However, if you point a gun or point a weapon or... Of somebody, of somebody running. And somebody runs away, you can't then shoot them. Well, that was the law in the UK. So the law is you, yeah. you have to use... Sort of Reasonable force. Uh, and an equal force to the threat that's happening. Right. And, and this yeah. guy shot them in the dark with their backs turned sort of thing. And I have it, I can't not say this. The guy eventually became a politician and endorsed the, um, uh, essentially, what was it called? The National Front and the um, British, some British party that's a fascist party. Oh, okay. So the the so person he, who did the shooting. He wasn't, he wasn't just a... Was a fascist. Lonely old farmer. He right. was a fascist. Well, there the you end. have it. Yeah. And no, we're not saying Gerald Stanley was a fascist. Just so you don't jump to any conclusions about what we're trying to say. When Colton didn't arrive when he said he would, Debbie, his mom, and her family went ahead and ate dinner without him. Assuming he was still out having fun with his friends, Debbie put Colton's dinner in the microwave to warm it up when he'd got home. She noticed a group of marked RCMP vehicles coming toward her trailer, which was soon surrounded by them. Guns drawn, the police approached and asked Debbie who Colton was to her. When she said he was her son, she was told he was deceased. <sighs> Uh, yeah. Sometimes I think I said this when we started the show. I, sometimes I think you do some of these shows just to get my blood boiling. I do. <laughs> yes. Having your guns drawn when you're telling a mother that her son is dead. Yeah. Oh, holy crap. Well. Yeah, I know what you're gonna say. They didn't know if the other guys were there, but I, I still, that's just horrible, Mike. <laughs> I think it's horrible too, and I'm not defending it. Yeah. But I'm, I want to explain it. So police were looking for Cassidy Cross, one of the people who was involved, and someone matching his description was reported to have been picked up hitchhiking and was driven back to the Red Pheasant Reserve. And police claimed a neighbor said someone who looked like Cassidy was seen near the Bushy property, but they didn't find him there. And Cassidy later voluntarily turned himself into the Battleford's detachment just after 5 p.m. the next day. Yeah. So Debbie, understandably, fell to pieces. She said later that RCMP officer dealing with her had shaken her, telling her to get it together, and even held her arms back, leaning in close, smelling her breath. Debbie asked him, what did I do? Oh, I, I can't even say anything. 
Uh, one of Colton's older brothers later recalled the RCMP swarming the house and going from room to room looking inside closets. And as I mentioned, they were looking right. for Cassidy. After turning himself in, Cassidy Cross admitted that he'd had about 30 shots of alcohol and was drunk on the day of the shooting. Early on, he denied that he and his friends were attempting to steal the truck at the first farm and that they were just checking it out. All charges against Colton's four companions were later dropped. In the CBC Point of View documentary, We Will Stand Up, Colton's sister Jade, wearing a hoodie on which is printed a raised red fist and the words, Justice for Colton, shared her memories about learning of her brother's death. Jade had been getting ready to dance at a powwow at the time when a cousin approached her with tears in her eyes. The cousin told her Coco, a family name for Colton, had died. Less than two hours after the shooting, RCMP took Gerald Stanley into custody at his home at 6.53 p.m. He was told he was being arrested for murder and advised of his rights to counsel. Stanley, after consulting with his attorney, exercised his right to remain silent and declined to make a statement to the police. The investigation faced various difficulties, including the absence of a blood spatter specialist at the scene and the washing away of footprints and blood due to rain. Additionally, the RCMP released the car where Bushi died only five days after his passing. In court, two days after Colton's death, Gerald Stanley was formally charged with second-degree murder and an additional charge of manslaughter resulting from careless use of a firearm. He first appeared in a North Battleford court to face these charges. RCMP were present to keep the peace as protesters holding signs with slogans like Justice for Colton were there to voice their concerns and support the Bushy family. Jace Bushy, Colton's brother, angrily shouted toward the massive press presence after the hearing, Not remorseful. No remorse in this man's eyes or his family's. For a lost baby. End quote. The former chief of the Red Pheasant Nation, Sheldon Watuni, spoke about his community's anger and grief and hopes that the legal system would do its part. He implored onlookers to have confidence in the process. Gerald Stanley was released on $10,000 bail to jeers from yet another crowd and allowed to live out his time until his trial free in the community. An RCMP release the day after Colton died read, quote, A man was declared dead at the scene. Another man associated to the property was arrested by police at the scene without incident. No charges were immediately laid. Three occupants of the vehicle, one woman, one girl, and one man, were taken into custody as part of a related theft investigation, police said. Police later identified and located a fourth boy who was in the vehicle, end quote. Now, some media outlets began reporting that Colton Bushy, it appeared, had been shot during the commission of a crime. People learning of the shooting in this light began to form the opinion that Gerald Stanley had killed the young man in self-defense and had been in fear for his life. On August 12, 2016, the CBC ran a story entitled Deadly Shooting Near Bigger Saskatchewan Sparks Debate Over Right to Defend. Many Indigenous folks took issue with the wording chosen by the RCMP in their statement, citing it as inflammatory and biased. FSIN, or the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations, representing 74 nations in Saskatchewan, made a statement. Chief of FSIN Bobby Cameron said in a statement released on August 12, 2016, We are saddened by the tragic death of Colton Bushy and offer our deepest condolences to his family and friends. This young man's death is a tragedy. We are extremely disappointed in the way the RCMP have presented the shooting incident near Bigger Saskatchewan on August 9, 2016. The news release the RCMP issued the following day provided just enough prejudicial information for the average reader to draw their own conclusions, that the shooting was somehow justified. The messaging in an RCMP news release should not fuel racial tensions. In the same press release, Red Pheasant Chief Clint Watuni wrote, quote, The family of Colton Bushy is devastated by the loss of their son. The media's initial portrayal of the event made the incident sound like a crime was about to be committed by the passengers in the car. The media based their reports on the RCMP's news release. End quote. The release continues. The shooting incident is causing concern among First Nations youth, said FSIN Youth Representative Andre Baer. There is growing concern that First Nation youth will travel in fear and be targeted because of the color of their skin. Our young people should not have to live in a state of fear because of hate. The release concluded, 
The FSIN is calling for a review of the RCMP's communication policies and writing guidelines in respect to the August 10, 2016 media release about the shooting incident near Bigger Saskatchewan. The RCMP news release was biased and not in line with the relationship the FSIN and the RCMP have been building with measures such as the RCMP-FSIN Partnership Protocol. The FSIN looks to the RCMP to ensure that their conduct respects that relationship. End quote. The RCMP responded. RCMP Superintendent Rob Cameron said, quote, We will be meeting with the FSIN, discussing their concerns, and looking at ways to move forward. Looking at that, hopefully, there are ways we can come to a solution. End quote. But the damage had been done. Many Canadians who'd heard the news, as reported after the news release and before this FSIN release, held polar opposite opinions regarding this situation. While some continued to call for justice for Colton, there were some downright ugly and racist statements as well. From the Guardian newspaper online, quote, As Bushy's family grieved the death of a caring young man who had been working toward becoming a firefighter, hate-filled comments flooded social media. His only mistake was leaving three witnesses, wrote one rural counselor, who later resigned. Another commenter said, He should have shot all five and been given a medal. Other Facebook comments read, Them buggers get all kinds of welfare money, so that is all they have to do. Booze, drugs, steal. We need handguns for protection. And another said, Shoot, shovel, shh. From the Star newspaper, one example of the social media backlash to the early press was a post on a GoFundMe page for the Stanleys, subsequently removed, that stated, quote, These dirty Indians off the res stopped in at our farm and tried to steal our vehicles, and when they couldn't, they vandalized it. After our farm pit stop, they carried on to Jerry's where things got out of hand. Matthew, you have comments about these well, comments. Yeah, I mean, you know, these comments show the reality of what many First Nations people live with on, mm, yep. on, on a daily basis, right? Mm -hmm. And it says to me that you can't take a case like this without considering race. Yeah. Right. You you can't you can't extract it. Right. If 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 people were angrily angrily writing like in the UK example about thieves. Yeah. Right. Like they did with the Martin case in the UK, um, then the debate would still probably be ugly around defending your home and your property. But statements like this just show the reality that it's it goes beyond that, and 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 you just can't say you you can't take race out of this some people go well it doesn't matter if what the race was right well they th but, but the commenters make it about race exactly yeah and that's what's underlying and you can't so when there are victims or crimes that involve first nations people because of where we are with how people are treated you, you can't separate it you can't just pretend it doesn't exist you can't do it does that make sense Saskatchewan Premier Brad Wall issued a statement calling for calm. Premier Wall wrote on a Facebook post, quote, Racism has no place in Saskatchewan. In the wake of a shooting near Bigger, there have been racist and hate-filled comments on social media and other forums. This must stop. These comments are not only unacceptable, intolerant, and a betrayal of the very values and character of Saskatchewan, they are dangerous. There are laws that protect citizens from what this kind of hate may foment. They will be enforced. I also have every confidence that the circumstances of Colton Bushy's death will be fully investigated by the RCMP and that the appropriate charges will be laid and prosecuted based on the evidence. None of us should be jumping to any conclusions about what happened. We should trust the RCMP to do their work. I call on Saskatchewan people to rise above intolerance, to be our best, to be the kind of neighbors and fellow citizens we are reputed to be. End quote. Now, as of this writing, there are 9.4 thousand likes on Wall's Facebook post. Forensic evidence clearly showed that Colton Bushy was fatally shot in the back of the head by a single bullet fired at a close range. Colton's family questioned why Gerald Stanley ran to get a gun rather than call the police. We mentioned that before. Debbie Baptiste, his mom, wondered why Gerald Stanley hadn't shot her son in the arm or the leg. Why, she thought out loud to a CBC documentary, did he have to shoot him in the back of the head? 
And that right there is really damning. Yeah. Right? Colton's family had petitioned for an out-of-province prosecutor for the trial to deal with possible local bias. However, their requests were unheeded. From the Canadian Encyclopedia.ca, quote, The jury was selected in less than a day. Prospective jurors were not asked whether they could decide the case on the evidence without relying on either pre-trial publicity or racist stereotypes about Bushi and his companions. Stanley's legal representation exercised five of 14 preemptory challenges to exclude visibly indigenous people. Bushi's family objected to these challenges. Bushi's mother had predicted before trial that, quote, if it's an all-white jury, we don't have a chance, end quote. And she's probably not wrong, right? No. I, I think the other side would say if there were First Nations people, there'd be no chance successfully defending it either, right? Mm -hmm. a and I think the problem is there's such a underlying racism uh, right. into the country that people go into camps um, based on these things, right? This camp or that camp, that to, to have an impartial jury is difficult. Right. Uh, for Like, I want the truth, and I want impartial juries who can get you there. And I think... What's really telling is at least everyone looked all white on the jury. I don't know if there were, was somebody yeah. that, that identifies or had mm -hmm. First Nations blood that wasn't, but they all looked white. And the kind of, you know, where's the balance in that, Mike, right? Was it thinking, you know, hey, if we have white people, they can be, have more of an ability to be impartial than First Nations people. Well, this is what the problem that I have with preemptory challenges, because you can just use this preemptory challenge. You don't have to explain your reasoning. And it doesn't seem like justice to me in a way. It's just like, oh, okay, so I'm going to challenge hit, this person steps up onto the, in, into the room to at, be asked questions about, you mm. know, being unbiased or whatever, which they weren't. And uh, you take a look at it. Oh, that looks like a, an indigenous person. So preemptory challenge, but you don't have to explain. That's why you did it. Yeah, I think preemptory challenges... They probably have their uses, but when it comes to race, mm -hmm. that's where they're problematic, right? T totally. Because yeah. sometimes it's don't like the look of a person. Well, well, this <laughs> right? is the thing. It's yeah. systemic. Yeah. It's in the system. Yeah. It's built into the system. At trial, Gerald Stanley took the stand and claimed his first two shots were warning shots and not aimed at anyone. He said that he had not intended to shoot Colton Bushy at all. The gun, he claimed had gone off accidentally. A hang fire caused as Stanley fired warning shots and a third round jammed in the weapon. A hang fire is a delay between pulling the trigger of a firearm and the discharge of a bullet. In other words, it's a delay between the trigger being pulled and the shot being fired. Hang fires can occur for a variety of reasons, including faulty ammunition, a misfire in the firing mechanism, or other mechanical problems. They can pose a safety hazard as the shooter may believe the weapon has not fired an attempt to manipulate it, causing it to discharge unexpectedly. Firearm specialists at Stanley's trial testified but were unable to confirm whether a hang fire had occurred. The RCMP expert for the prosecution stated that studies showed hang fires were less than a half second, making Stanley's defense unlikely. However, the trial judge allowed a hunting guide that stated guns should be kept in a safe position for 30 to 60 seconds if there was no discharge, despite a lack of scientific evidence. Additionally, two witnesses were permitted to testify that they'd experienced hang fire delays of 7 to 12 seconds, which would support Stanley's testimony. On the stand, Colton's friend, Cassidy Cross, painted a very different story. To Cassidy, the first two initial shots were not warning shots at all. From a newspaper article by reporter Bill Graveland, quote, Cross said that he was blinded by glass when the SUV's windshield was smashed. He said he jumped out and ran after the SUV hit another vehicle on the Stanley farm. We didn't think about it. We just ran. I was scared out of my mind, he said. As I was running and got to the approach, I heard a ricochet. I heard a bullet right by my right ear, end quote. Cassidy Cross also admitted under cross-examination that he'd intended to steal the other farmer's truck before arriving at the Stanley's farm. This was contrary to evidence he'd given at the preliminary trial, but he indicated that when it came to the groups entering the Stanley's farm, he stuck to his story, saying they were there only looking for help with their flat tire by that point. Cross gave his reasons for his earlier lies. 
from Bill Graveland's news article. Quote, I told the Crown, Cross responded, because honestly, I was scared for myself and I was scared for the people there that might get into trouble. I know that it was wrong, but that's just how I was feeling over there. Cross added that he was willing to face the consequence for the sudden departure from his testimony at an earlier preliminary hearing. I was young, I was stupid, and I've changed a lot since that happened, Cross replied, end quote. The witness in the back seat of the car was also accused of lying as she was said to have seen Stanley shoot twice, but evidence suggests only one shot was fired. The Crown prosecutor advised the jury not to rely on her testimony. Mm -hmm. Gerald Stanley's legal team jumped on this, challenging the credibility of Bushy's companions who had testified at both the preliminary inquiry and the trial. They pointed to some of the group's prior criminal records and inconsistencies in their accounts. Stanley took the stand and claimed that he was scared for his family due to a 1994 murder at a nearby farm and that cars were being used as weapons, referencing the terrorist attack in Nice, France in 2016. The trial judge failed to mention the laws of self-defense and defense of property as Stanley did not formally plead self-defense. Mm -hmm. Stanley's lawyer emphasized during closing arguments that the Stanleys were on their own and facing a nightmare situation. How far away was the farm from help? From the RCMP detachment yeah. in Bigger Saskatchewan? Minutes. Minutes away. Okay, because um, this parallel that I'm drawing, the guy was in Norfolk far away from, from any help. Mm -hmm. And... It part, and, but he shot people in the back. In the part dark. of the story back then was yeah. um, kind of that homesteader mentality of, of where you're really on your own. And it sounds like that's what their lawyers are trying to play up. The trial judge instructed the jury on the accidental hang fire defense and emphasized that Stanley should benefit from any reasonable doubt. However, he also noted that if the gun was accidentally discharged, the jury should still consider if Stanley was guilty of manslaughter through careless use of a firearm and whether he had a lawful excuse for such use. The trial did not go the way Colton Bushy's family had hoped it would, and the result for them was disappointing. It only took 15 hours of deliberation for the jury to come back with a verdict. Gerald Stanley was acquitted of both murder and manslaughter. Free to go. Someone in the courtroom, unable to contain their disgust, yelled at Stanley, You're a murderer. A kid died. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. um, that's a fact. Colton died. Mm -hmm. Yep. I would think that the minimum that should have happened would be manslaughter. To walk away free and clear? Mm -hmm. I don't understand how, how that's justice. Well, there was like a hint of justice in the case. Just, just a sniff. Oh, no. A hair. Tell me. Of justice. Gerald Stanley was fined $3,000 plus a $900 victim surcharge and banned from owning firearms for 10 years after he pleaded guilty to improper storage of firearms. Police discovered the guns at Stanley's property when they were responding to Colton Bushy's fatal shooting, of which Stanley was acquitted. <sighs> Mike, <laughs> stop doing this to me. So $3,900 for... For the poor kid. Yeah. That's all he got. Yeah. And I don't know what, like, I don't know where the victim surcharge money goes. Apparently I could have ap applied for something after the person who beat me up was convicted, but I didn't. Yeah. How the jury came to their verdict is unknown, as they are not required to give reasons, and in Canada, jurors are legally prohibited from revealing their deliberations. We'll never know why they came to the conclusions they did. All we can do is speculate, and many believe the decision was biased by race. At the parliamentary question period after the acquittal, in an unconventional move, Prime Minister Trudeau weighed in. He said, quote, While it would be completely inappropriate to comment on the specifics of this case, we understand that there are systemic issues in our criminal justice system that we must address, we are committed to broad-based reform to address these issues. As a country, we must and we can do better, end quote. Then Justice Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould and Indigenous Services Minister Jane Philpott also took to Twitter to express their support for Bushy's family and assert the need for improvement. Wilson-Raybould thanked the PM and wrote, My thoughts are with the family of Colton Bushy tonight. 
I truly feel your pain and I hear all of your voices. As a country we can and must do better, I am committed to working every day to ensure justice for all Canadians. Jane Philpott echoed the sentiments. Devastating news tonight for the family and friends of Colton Bushy. My thoughts and prayers are with you in your time of grief and pain. We all have more to do to improve justice and fairness for Indigenous Canadians, end quote. Canadians, though, were divided. Some agreed with the verdict wholeheartedly, while others, like Colton Bushy's family, felt Gerald Stanley had gotten away with murder. You know, it's, this whole thing is, there are issues on both sides. You know, sure, the kids shouldn't have been doing what they're doing, probably. Right? Yeah. Um, but Stanley shouldn't have been shooting, or even if, let me give benefit of the doubt, okay, mm. even if the gun had misfired, it shouldn't have been out in the first place, and it shouldn't have been pointed at the back of somebody's head. That's right. So even if it misfired, you should have got manslaughter, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, justice wasn't served here. Yeah, our opinion. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm allowed to have it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Almost two months after the acquittal, the Minister of Justice, Wilson Raybould, introduced a comprehensive law reform bill in Parliament. This bill aimed to eliminate preemptory challenges following the recommendations made by the 1991 Manitoba Aboriginal Justice Inquiry. According to an article on Can Lee, the Canadian Legal Information Institute, in the fall of 2019, preemptory challenges were abolished in Canadian jury trials, much to the chagrin of many criminal law practitioners. Ostensibly, Bill C-75 was passed partially in response to the fallout stemming from the controversial R v. Stanley verdict, a case which preemptory challenges were alleged to remove any and all jurors who appeared to be Indigenous. Bill C-75 has not been without its own controversy, however. Commentary by both legal professionals and scholars indicates that Bill C-75, though well-intentioned, may ultimately do more harm than good for the very communities it purports to serve. Numerous criminal law practitioners were quick to criticize Bill C-75 as being knee-jerk, reactionary, and ultimately a highly political move that would do little to address the systemic issues plaguing the criminal justice system in Canada, particularly for racialized and marginalized communities. Several respondents to the decision stated quite clearly that they perceived the decision to be politically motivated based on the results of the Stanley trial. In the words of one, Quote, it seems to be a political decision in response to a single case rather than an administration of justice decision in response to a wider concern. Another indicated, it would appear that this action was taken for political reasons to score points without actually accomplishing anything positive, in fact making the problems C-75 purported to solve worse. One respondent, one respondent was quite blunt in stating, Completely political decision based on the perceived bias produced in one trial. Unproven and politically correct and motivated. We have centuries of work undone by a few boneheads influenced by journalist boneheads saying they and they alone have the answers. End quote. In March of 2021, the Civilian Review and Complaints Commission, CRCC, which is the RCMP watchdog agency, completed a three-year investigation into the RCMP's handling of the case. The report from the CRCC found that the RCMP showed insensitivity and racial discrimination toward Debbie Baptiste, Colton Bushy's mother, when seven armed officers searched her home without a proper warrant and informed her of her son's death. Additionally, the report revealed that the police mishandled witnesses and evidence and that the initial RCMP press release about the shooting gave the impression that Bushy's death was, quote, deserved. The report stated that the police investigation was generally, quote, professional and reasonable, but also called for significant organizational change within the RCMP. However, it was later reported by the Globe and Mail that the RCMP conducted a separate internal investigation into the handling of the case without informing the CRCC and destroyed records of police communications from the night of Bushy's death. The RCMP claimed that the records were not relevant as evidence and were disposed of two years after the case was closed, following their records retention policy. Well, why do I have to keep my tax records for seven years? Anyway, this action was taken despite the fact that the CRCC investigation was already underway. 
and a civil lawsuit had been filed against the RCMP by Bushi's family. A reaction by certain community members of North Battleford was telling when, soon after the release of the CRCC report, White Lives Matter signs began appearing in that community. Why not uh, farmer safety matters or private property rights matter, matter signs, right? Because it's race. Because if it was private property rights matter or farmers rights matter, I would say, yeah, I get it, right? People people want more safety and security. Right. Um, but white lives matter just right there. It just shows the ugly truth of, of what's underneath this entire story. Right, racism. From an APTN article, Wayne Samaganis, chief of the Little Pine First Nation, whose community is near North Battleford, expressed his concerns. It doesn't paint a good picture for our community when we have mothers and fathers wanting to take their children away because they don't feel safe. They don't feel like they're accepted in the community. They don't feel part of it, said Semaganis. He said, racism is an issue that has been here for a long time, but there is hope. This is a problem that has built up through generations. It's not something we can eradicate overnight, but I think we're making progress, he said, end quote. Bushi's legacy has had a lasting impact on the country, with many advocating for changes in the criminal justice system to address the systemic barriers and biases faced by Indigenous peoples. His family has also been vocal in calling for justice in his case and has inspired others to stand up against racial violence. Colton Bushi will always be remembered as a symbol of the ongoing struggle for justice and equality for Indigenous people in Canada. Now, according to an APTN article as of February 2022, and I'm sure they still are, Colton Bushy's family is pushing still for change. You know, I'm looking at a picture of Colton Bushy right yeah. now. Yeah. You know, young guy. Yep. Young guy. He looks quite smart. He has what I call smart, smart guy glasses on. Sure. Right? And it's just such a shame that he's gone. Mm-hmm. Wait, he, he didn't get to live a life. No. And that's it for Dark Poutine episode 256, The Killing of Colton Bushy. Many people wanted us to do this one, and now it's done. I mean... (laughs) Sorry, I keep sawing into the microphone. But Matthew's exasperation is real. It's not... This isn't feigned. We don't... We don't just like... Like yesterday, I texted you. I was like, Mike. Yeah. What are you doing? This one is so difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I can understand, in a way, crimes of passion, or I can understand, you know, mental health issues, etc. But when it comes to to overt and blatant racism that a lot of people showed um, from the outcome of this, it just kills me that, that so many people still think that way. Me too. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at one 327 5786 or one 827 darkptn We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. It is time for voicemail. I like voicemails. Let's listen to uh, our first one. What do you think? Go for it. Okay, here we go. Hi. This is Sandy. I'm calling to make a correction. Uh, I called previously referencing Grand Valley Prison, and I have to make a correction and say that I know it's actually Grand Valley Institution for Women, and I have to make this correction because being from the area and also studying in community, community and criminal justice, I know my classmates and my teachers would just make fun of me for making that error. So I felt the need to correct that. And along with that, I will share more embarrassing stories here. Um, I actually did go for a tour of uh, the institution there. And when you go in, they will swipe usually your ID or something on you for drugs. And uh, during that, of all of my classmates, I ended up uh, coming positive for high levels of THC when I actually don't smoke weed, uh, but I ended up getting dinged on my glasses. So I had to get a 
heavily frisked and I had to get a, a canine drug dog to sniff me and everything in front of my class and teachers. That was quite embarrassing. Um, and I think we all thought that, you know, the class donor would get, you know, <laughs> dinged for <laughs> THC and said, it was the uh, class brown noser who got um, <laughs> dinged. So my uh, word of advice would be avoid playing poker with a bunch of stoners the day before you go <laughs> to, into visiting a prison or an institution. So there's my fun story about uh, Grand Valley Institution for Women. I hope you have a great day. Bye. Well, thank you for correcting yourself. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder if those machines aren't set up to just like every 13th person. Or every rand, like every once in a while, just okay, pull this well, random I was person. Like, I was like, but but cannabis is legal. Then I realized they're going into prison, right? So, so it was about bringing things in. Exactly. Well, that that's a good that's a good note because next time I go to a men's prison, I'd like to pet a dog and get frisked by a guy. <laughs> oh, it's so inappropriate. No. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing. I'm laughing that Sandy called back in because she's like, my classmates are going to make fun of me because I know it's called institution, not prison. No oh boy. <laughs> Thanks for calling Sandy. Thank you. All right. Here's another. Hi guys. My name's Mandy and I'm calling from Vancouver Island. I had a case recommendation for you guys. I'm not sure if you've covered. Uh, sadly, she hasn't gotten a lot of attention. Uh, so her name was Agnes Bings. She was murdered in Victoria in 1899, and the aftermath and just the crime scene was so gruesome that people actually thought that Jack the Ripper had made his way to Canada after the Whitechapel murders uh, about 10 years earlier. Um, and it's never been solved, so it's a fascinating case, but so sad, and I don't see enough podcasts on it. It's been mentioned in a few books, such as uh, Victoria's Most Haunted by Ian Gibbs, and I believe Shannon Sin uh, touched on it in his book, uh, Vancouver, um, Haunted Vancouver Island. Uh, but I'd love to hear it on a podcast. And to take the guesswork out of my career, I am a poutine wrangler specializing in density and structure of cheese curds. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for such a wonderful podcast. And go take a shit in your hat. Bye. <laughs> poutine so, wrangler. So I was looking uh, at some potential cases this past week and this case came up oh. uh, uh, agnes bings it's I, really fascinating I, and they say potentially ca canada's answer to jack the ripper is the i i like doing the old cases from like the 1800s yeah it's it's an it, they're not as they're not as um i know when they're relatives still alive i always feel it's tougher to cover yeah, yeah. Mandy, I'm gonna. I can see the island from my window at home. I'll wave at you tonight. Okay, wave. <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah. So it's on my list of things to do. Uh, there's not a lot of information, obviously, because it took place in the 1800s. But I did find a report by the Pinkertons, the security uh -huh. company, the Pinkertons, who investigated at that time. It's uh -huh. really fascinating. Let's do it. Um, I also like that sheet calls out that cheese curds actually have to have a consistency that they do none of this like a lot of people think poutine is just cheese on top no 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 no, no it no. is cheese curds you need that little bit of squeak on your teeth when you yes, eat it that is correct <laughs> so here's our last voicemail uh, of three hi there it's roseanne calling from hamilton ontario i'm just going to let you know how much i enjoy your podcast you guys are great interesting stuff I'm just wondering if you guys would consider doing an episode on uh, George Lovey, the George Lovey murders. Of course, he's from Hamilton. Um, I'm from the east of end of Hamilton, and I, I, I just vaguely remember this story, but I, I do remember it. And interestingly enough, I live in the east end, and at the traffic circle in Hamilton, was Lovey's Variety. And I'm pretty darn sure that was owned by George Lovey's parents. So maybe you can loop that in and let us know whether that's true or not. I believe it is. Um, so hopefully you'll consider that episode and uh, keep up the good work, guys. So 
George Love we George Lovey we have mentioned in a in another podcast and we'll we'll ask you to to find that yourself because I'm not going <laughs> to scroll back through everything but anyway we have mentioned him uh because he was in a halfway house with another famous Canadian killer so George Lovey has been on my radar for quite some time uh yeah it's it's an interesting story Thanks for the call from Steel Town. Steel Town. Hammer Town. Hammer Town, or what to call it. Stop. Hammer Town. <laughs> nee, 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 nee. You went to college in Hammer Town? Yep. Was it was it uh more than you'd hoped? I had a good time. There you go. That's all that's important, really. And did you learn anything though? Well, I guess that's important too. I learned how to do advertising. There you go. And you're still doing it. Mm-hmm. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 827 We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. All right, we have a single patron this week, and her name is Karen Phillips. Karen Phillips. Hello, Karen Phillips. And I don't know where Karen is from, Matthew. Karen's from Frankfurt. Frankfurt, Germany? Yep. Okay. I always have to clarify because sometimes there are Frankfurt... Everywhere else. Everywhere else, yeah. And uh, what does Karen do in Frankfurt, Germany? She is from the Phillips light bulb family. Are there... Is that where Phillips light bulbs are made in Frankfurt, Germany? Yeah, yeah Phillips is in Germany. Yep. Oh, well, there you go. There you go. Well, so, yeah, so, so she's, she's got she's got cash to burn. I have Hugh Phillips lights. Uh, when you say Alexa, turn off the office, and she, and she just did. And now she we're just sitting did. in the dark. Now we're sitting in the dark, <laughs> and I have to say, Alexa, turn on the office. And now she ignored me. Sometimes she doesn't work. Alexa, turn on the office. Oh, there she there worked she that time. She, I, she fell asleep. She was napping. She was just <laughs> too worn out after my first <laughs> command. Anyway, Thanks. But, thank you, Karen. And thank you for lighting up my home. Yes. I appreciate we, we that. We do appreciate it. Yeah. And keeping the lights on. Yeah, there you go. By being a Patreon. Yes, exactly. <laughs> 100% keeping <laughs> Literally the keeping the lights on. <laughs> yeah. Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors past and present for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And that's it for this week. Uh, until next week, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.